This tank chat is going to be about the British Army's Challenger tank, what became the Challenger 1 tank when the Challenger 2 came into service. Uh, and bear with me because this story is a bit of a complex one, what leads up to the actual adoption of the Challenger. Now, we've talked already about that idea in the post-Cold War era, if a tank goes into service, almost immediately another programme is started for the replacement of that tank in perhaps 10, 15 years time. And quite often other programmes are beginning, um, as soon as it goes into service, to improve the tank whilst it's in service. Now, back at the end of the 1960s, the British had the Chieftain tank in service, the Germans had the Leopard, and they were both going to be looking at a replacement to come into service sometime in the early 1980s. And what happens is Britain and Germany get together and they form an alliance to come up with an idea that uh, in early 1970 is going to be called the future main battle tank. And off they go and start researching about what might be required for that. And some of the ideas, they, they again start off by doing the classic, let's think outside the box, do we need a turreted tank? Should we go for a casement vehicle um, with a gun without a turret? That sort of thing. So that project goes on and lots of technologically um, sort of investigative projects are started trying to find out what would be the best way of doing this? What else can we actually apply in a range of different areas from automotive, gunnery to protection? Now, meanwhile, in the background, Britain has also developed Burlington or Chobham Armour. Uh, it's named Chobham because the main place Chobham in Surrey where they did the work on it. Now, that new type of armour was they they'd offered it to the Americans um, when this future main battle tank program got going, they also offered it to the Germans as well. But we hadn't actually put it on a tank ourselves in Britain. So they came up with the idea of a fighting vehicle, FV4211. And that was going to be a chieftain automotive based vehicle, but we were gonna add that new Chobham armor for the first time. And again, this was really the first properly uh, laminated armoured vehicle with a new Chobham and they did that in the early 1970 as a test vehicle as well to have a look at it, see how it might work on, a, on an actual tank, this, this brand new and very, very effective new armour system um, that they'd come up with up at Chertsey or Chobham as the site is known. So there's another parallel going on there. And that vehicle, we actually have it here at the Tank Museum, that was kept secret. It was only actually admitted about until in 1976 um, because of the nature. They wanted to keep uh, the nature of this new type of armour uh, away from prying eyes, obviously. Um, now, so different projects are going on. Another project that's going on is the idea of a, of a gun that can fit on all NATO tanks. What size should that be? Should it be 120, 105 or 110? Um, that was another experimentation that was going on there. And back in Germany as well, the Germans are also doing, they've started the Leopard 2 project. Um, they're looking at that as not just replacing Leopard 1, but the rest of our uh, armoured vehicles that were still in their fleet. And by 76, the Germans are coming to the conclusion that actually Leopard 2 and not this future main battle tank program is the way they want to go. So in 77, uh, the future main battle tank program is completely cancelled. But technologies that have been developed for that and ideas are actually carried forward into other projects, which is why these are important ones to, to know about going on in the background. So with the future main battle tank program cancelled, that left Britain in a position where it doesn't have a replacement tank lined up ready for the chieftain. And so what are we going to do about it? Though they start a new program that's just a national program. And that program is going to be called MBT-80, main battle tank 80. And again, they come up with a number of requirements of what they want that tank to be. And even though MBT-80 doesn't actually progress into a, a physical tank, it's an important project because yet again, the military are coming up with specifications, developing technologies that are then going to be used further on in other vehicles. 
Now, MBT 80 is a program. It's uh, developed at the, again at the Chobham and the Chertsey site uh, by the military vehicle engineering establishment, MEVI as it's known, and they're looking at, again, what is going to be the best way of creating that new replacement tank. And they actually go for the ideas behind it seem to be fairly traditional. It's going to have a three-man turret, driver at the front of the vehicle, and probably a 120 millimetre again. They like the idea of the smooth bore gun, um, but in actual fact, they decide to go for a rifled gun for this tank because they think that with rifled ammunition already in production for the Chieftain, stocks of it are going to be out there. They can't predict exactly when an MBT-80 would be ready to go into production, so isn't it better that something that's can, uh, that could be compatible for both, both tanks is kept on? And that's why they go for the idea of the rifled gun for it. Now, as that MBT-80 programme is going along, in the background, Britain is trying to sell tanks to the Shah of Iran. From the early 1970s, the Shah of Iran's been interested in buying tanks off of Britain. That programme develops into uh, a, a programme that ends up with three types of tanks that are going to be sold to the Shah. And this project becomes FV4030, and each individual type of tank becomes slash one, slash two, slash three. And what we've got is the first part of that project, FV4030 slash one, is really we're just selling them a chieftain with a few alterations on it. Um, about 125 of those are going to be sold. The second part of the project is a tank uh, the Iranians want to call Shear One. It's FV4030 slash two. And that tank is really a chieftain front end with a new engine in the back, a Rolls-Royce diesel going in the back of the vehicle. So the rear end of that vehicle looks very different. The front end looks very similar to chieftain. And again, there's going to be just under 200 of those tanks ordered. The real clincher though, is they want 1,250 of a brand new tank they're going to call Shear 2. And that will be uh, FV4030 slash 3. And this is going to be a new tank that is going to have the Chieftain gun in essence, some improved fire control systems that already Britain is developing to upgrade its Chieftain. They call that IFCS, Improved Fire Control System. It's also going to have this new system of hydro gas suspension, uh, which has got great play and gives a really smooth ride to a tank. They're going to put that. They're going to get Chobham armor on this new vehicle. So it's going to have stunning levels of protection. And really, altogether, this is a brand new tank. We're not just talking about a Chieftain derivative there. Um, lots of new things are going into the vehicle. Now, they compress the development of that vehicle to five years at Meavy up at Chertsey. Um, so this development process is speeded up, and again, because it's taking some of the ideas from previous projects and being able to put them together. Now, 1979 is the crucial year in all of this because early in 1979, the Shah of Iran is deposed and the project for buying these tanks is suddenly scuppered. So what are we going to do? What's going to happen about this? How are we going to cover things off? Um, so what happens is Jordan, later in that same year, steps forward and says, we would like to buy the Shear One tank. That's basically that Chieftain tank with a new engine and rear end on it. And that goes off into Jordanian service and uh, they buy the, the ones that are being built already and they actually order a few more. Um, the second part of the project is a real problem for Britain because we've been lining up all the factories to build this Shear 2 tank. All the work and development's gone into it. What are we going to do about this? And they estimate about 10,000 jobs are on the line um, to do with Royal Ordnance Factory leads, all the subcontractors and suppliers. So what happens is a quick shuffling of feet Discussions go on in uh, the summer of 79, and what happens is a young major in the British Army is put the task of coming up with a new general service requirement. Uh, his name is Patrick Cordingly. We'll meet him again a bit later on. And he is told to put together a paper to say how we could get um, what is 4030 slash 3, in other words, a sheer 2 tank, could we convert it into something that the British Army can use instead of MBT-80? 
and in the end that decision is actually made. MB80 is stopped. Some of the projects to do with MB80 keep going. In other words, they keep development in some of the areas and some of those projects we'll see returning later, especially to do with Challenger 2. But the idea of MB80 is no, that now won't be the complete replacement for the Chieftain fleet. We are now going to go in a different direction and we're going to get this tank that was first called in the paperwork Cheviot and then it's given later in uh, the summer of uh, July of 1980 when it's announced in Parliament they're going to call it Challenger and that becomes the tank. Now Challenger is not the tank that the British Army had specified when it was dealing with MBT-80. In other words it hasn't got some of those features on it that it wanted. Yes it's got um, that wonderful new Chobham armour, but not necessarily to the same levels as they wanted on MBT-80. It's got this new uh, CV-12 uh, engine, this new uh, diesel engine that's been put together by Rolls-Royce. That particular engine, they uprate it to 1,200 horsepower from the old earlier version that had 800 horsepower. So yes, it's got a fair old bit of welly behind it in terms of engine power, but in terms of, and again, it's got that new hydrogas suspension, but the gunnery is not the improvement the army were looking for, because basically what they're doing is taking, in essence, the chieftain gun and the gunnery and putting it on this new tank. So there were issues there. So as the Challenger starts getting built with one or two improvements on it, things like straight away they're going to add togs, thermal imaging on the side of the turret. They're going to add the classic British Army CES kit, all the stuff a normal British vehicle should be taking with it. So they do that anyway, um, but they also start a programme called CHIP. Challenger, and uh, early days it was Chieftain as well, uh, improvement programme. And the idea is straight away, even as they're building the Challenger tank, they're looking at projects to upgrade it. A better quality 120 millimeter gun is top of that list. Um, so that programme is going on in the background straight away. 1983, the very first tanks are issued out to the army. Royal Hussars are the first ones to be equipped with it. What do you get with a Challenger 1? So the L11 gun is really a, just a slight improvement on the gun that was on the Chieftain. Um, it would carry about 64 rounds inside the turret and again this is still a very very impressive gun. One thing they did manage to develop for the Challenger is a new version of the armour-piercing fin-stabilised discarding sabot round and that actually during the production run meant that some of the bins inside the vehicles had to be changed and again like a lot of tanks when they're going about 420 Challenger ones are actually produced when they're going through the production run there are slightly different build specs and improvements so you can go up to uh, sometimes they call it Mark III for example with the new bins in. Um, that gun has a thermal observation and gunnery system, the sight, and one of the amazing things about that compared to some of the earlier generation vehicles, and certainly when we come on to Operation Granby, the idea that this vehicle can see at night and can see through haze, a lot of the vehicles it was fighting against from the Iraqi army didn't have that capacity at all, um, and that gave this vehicle tremendous advantage. So very good firepower, but it certainly wasn't the very latest um, type of weapon system that was being designed in Britain. Um, the Chobham armour, when you look at a Challenger tank, what you're really looking at on the outside is a skin. Chobham, when it's developed, is put into armour packs that are flat, and that's why it doesn't have the rounded shape. There's another advantage, by the way, to this faceted shape, and that's to do with um, radar deflection and stealth. Um, so you shouldn't really necessarily have a right angle on the tank at all. Um, so what goes on there is on, under an outer steel skin, that's where the armour packs. And again, mentioning Operation Granby, when in 1991, um, British tanks end up going about, 260 of them ending up going out to fight in the liberation of Kuwait. Those tanks have extra armour added. At the moment, the tank we're looking at here has got normal bazooka plates or side skirts on. Extra armour was specifically put on the side uh, and added as well as add-on explosive reactive armour or era armour was put on the front of the tank uh, for when it went out to fight. And again, in Operation Granby, because there was a worry about this gun, was it still up to it, taking on the latest T-72 model tanks, they actually issued 
12 extra rounds for each Challenger, um, which were what they were called Jericho rounds. They were basically depleted uranium um, in the long rod penetrator, and that was thought to give it that extra edge to get through whatever's on the front of a T-72. Uh, in the back, we've mentioned the 1,200 horsepower engine. That would give this a speed up to 35 miles an hour and with extra fuel on the back as well. That was another thing they did for Operation Granby. They did some experiments. Is it wise carrying um, extra cans of diesel on the back, extra drums? And when they were doing experiments, shooting them up, even when they did catch fire, they were still, you could jettison them, and they were still in a position where um, the vehicle didn't seem to suffer at all. So extra drums you'll see were added on the rear to extend the range of the Challenger 1s in Granby. And uh, again, from the point of view, you're doing over 200 miles as a, as a standard uh, fuel tank on these tanks. And that was one of the other great things about Challenger 1 is if you put it next to Abrams, actually it can do about double the distance without refuel, having to refuel. And again, in actual times of combat, because refueling a tank is not an easy task and it can take quite a while as well because these things take such a lot of fuel. Um, so that idea, that was another advantage the Challenger had. Um, so the power is great. You can see on the side the hydrogas suspension giving it a smooth ride and that added to the gunnery issues because from the point of view of that gun, if it's on a smoother platform firing on the move again, it means there's a better chance it's going to fire accurately and get a first round hit. Inside the turret, you've got the classic crew of three up there. Um, you've got the commander, you've got the loader, who's putting in first of all the projectile, then the bag charge, and they often call it three-part ammunition because there's a charge that actually detonates that on the end of the gun. The driver of the Challenger is right down at the front of the vehicle and underneath his seat, which has got a couple of positions, he can drive with his head out, he can drive uh, in a what they call a supine position, almost laying back, looking out of his scope there, and that can be changed so he can have a night driving vision scope. Um, and he's also got a way of collapsing the seat and he can reverse back underneath the main gun and exit through the turret should he need to. Um, in an emergency. So for example, if you're in combat, you know, the tank gets knocked out with a gun barrel over his hatch, he's still got a way of exiting the vehicle. This particular Challenger 1 tank was actually under the command of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Dinaro. Um, traditionally as the CO of his unit, the Irish as ours, this tank is called Churchill. And this was one of the tanks that went out in the Gulf War. And again, the crew, a um, bit like pilots nowadays as well, on the side have got their stencils of their names. And we had the great pleasure of bringing the crew back, reuniting them with this tank. And it actually went in the Lord Mayor's Parade some years ago. Um, and that's one of the advantages we've got, where we've got a tank that's fairly recently in service. Lots of people um, can give us their opinions, they can give us their accounts and their memories of actually serving on a Challenger tank. So in Operation Granby, one of the issues before Operation Granby was we've already discussed the idea, was this tank really what the Army wanted? There was nervousness about reliability. Um, they did look at the fact that they were thinking, hang on a second, I mentioned these extra Jericho rounds, is the firepower going to be up to it? And Cordingly, Brigadier Patrick Cordingly, is put in charge of what becomes the armoured element of the 1st UK Division that goes out um, to help liberate Kuwait. And one of the things he was really adamant about is afterwards he went to Meavy, back up to Chertsey, saying to the people who, who put this tank together and also saying to the people that built it, that at the end of the campaign he had got 98% of his vehicles were still in full working order. The challengers took on and knocked out 400 Iraqi tanks with no losses uh, to themselves at all. And actually in February of uh, 1991, a Challenger 1 fires an armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo round uh, 2.9 miles and knocks out an Iraqi tank. And that is still recognized as the longest tank-on-tank -tank kill recorded. So what he was basically trying to say to people was actually, come the day, this tank worked very well for the troops that were in it. And why he was so keen to emphasize that is a person that was involved very early on in the project. Um, in 1987, the Challenger 1s went out to Germany to take part in something called the Canadian Army Trophy, or CAT 87 as it became known. 
And that's a, a, basically a gunnery competition. It's a series of tanks from different nations um, line themselves up and they do different types of target shooting and they're graded and judged. Challenger 1 came last. There was a bit of a balls up. There's no other way of describing it uh, in what happened there. And Challenger 1 came last. And so accordingly, who was obviously disappointed about this as someone involved in the project, was able to say afterwards, actually, with great conviction and evidence, that look, Challenger is a tank for war, not for competitions, and he meant it, um, because really that tank did its business when we needed it. Now, it comes out of service, the very last ones in British service come out of service in 2001, something called the Al Hussein Project. They're uh, gifted and some are sold uh, to the Jordanian army. So the Challenger 1 was then put into service in the Jordanian army, whilst Challenger 2 came into service with the British army. And those Challenger 1s, um, by the very clever Jordanian CAD B Bureau, have been upgraded in a number of different ways. So some of them have now got a uh, crewless turret put on them, and uh, some of them are being used again, like so many countries, instead of disposing of what is a very well-protected hull, they've actually upgraded them and using them for other functions as well. So. Of those 420, there's probably about 20 left in the UK. The rest of them ended out going out to Jordan of the Challenger 1 story. And uh, we're very pleased we've got not only this tank that saw service in um, that first Gulf War in Operation Granby here, but we've got some other examples here and also a, a plethora of those other vehicles that not only helped develop the Challenger, but uh, also the other ones that were put into place, such as re armoured recovery vehicle. And we'll probably do a separate tank chat to look at those ones. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And please do subscribe to the Tank Museum's channel on YouTube and support us on Patreon so that we can make even more videos like this.